on this Monday night. A brutal blizzard blasts Ontario and Quebec. It's Canada, it is what it is. I think I got stuck about 15 times. The traffic frozen to a standstill. A premier pitching in and the snow day for kids. Canada's first stamp of approval for a COVID pill. Who will get the drug when and what's known about it so far? A Global News exclusive, Canada's special forces deployed to Ukraine. The mission and rising tensions with Moscow. Plus, making waves across the Atlantic. I'll get there when I get there. One man's exhaustive goal to shatter a rowing record and honor his grandfather. Global National with Donna Friesen. It is winter and it is Canada, but this January blast is not your standard storm. A huge swath of southern Ontario and Quebec is under winter storm and snowfall warnings. The snow started early in the morning and plows simply could not keep up. In Toronto, major arteries were closed, streetcars stuck in their tracks and people were advised to stay home. Schools stayed shut on what was said to be the return of in-person learning. Quebec, too, has declared a snow day. Good evening and thanks for joining us. It is not that we don't expect any snowfall. It's the amount combined with the strong winds that's the issue. This satellite image shows what a beast of a snowstorm this is swirling across the region. Toronto is forecast to get between 40 to 60 centimeters, Ottawa between 30 to 50 centimeters. We have complete coverage tonight, beginning with Mike Drolet in Toronto. And go. It was a rude awakening for much of Ontario, this way. and dogs were no exception. The storm came in fast, leaving a swath from Niagara through Ottawa under a deep blanket of snow. Up to 60 centimeters in parts. The traditional snow belt south of Lake Ontario saw whiteout conditions and drifts that confounded even the plows. Nobody was immune to getting stuck, not even buses and fire trucks. Early in the morning, commuters who weren't already working remotely were urged to stay home. And when two of Toronto's largest highways were shut down because crews couldn't keep up, the city's other arteries turned into traffic jams. It's terrible. <laughs> I mean, I've been driving for 30 years. I have never seen anything like this, you know what I mean? It's like so many cars in a, in a ditch on the side of the road. And then in the city infamous for calling in the army to combat snow, Ontario's premier digging out cars and giving people lifts, unmasked in his own. This is Doug Ford. <laughs> I'm a taxi driver today. Toronto never gets massive snowfall. Well, obviously not never because I can barely walk down this road and it's completely impassable over here, but rarely. A typical year will see the top snowfall at 15 to 20 centimeters. And today with well over 30 centimeters, we're looking at a top 10 day in the city's history. What makes this storm so unique was the path it took to get here. It dipped far south uh, across the United States before coming up the eastern seaboard. So that was a bit more unusual. Uh, usually we would see a system like this affecting Quebec and the Maritimes. For once, Ottawa may have had a snow day milder than Toronto's, although they were digging out there too, making the most of this unplanned down day. It's awfully coincidental on the day that the kids are supposed to go back to school that it one further delay in, uh, in returning them to some semblance of normalcy. In that regard, this may have been exactly what kids needed. A day to be kids again, to hit the hills with toboggans in tow and make a snow angel or two. Dad, it left me up. Mike Trelay, Global News, Toronto. I'm Mike Armstrong in Montreal. If there's a positive from this storm, it may be that it didn't catch anyone by surprise. It was one of those all hands on deck operations, even before the snow started falling. Salt trucks and snow plows hit the roads, and the public was told, if you can, stay off the roads. If you have the chance to stay home and warm, that's fine. For the most part, people followed that advice. There was little traffic just about anywhere. Streets looked like ghost towns. There was actually less accumulation than predicted, but there were strong gusts. I'm just uh, yeah, worried about power failures. That's my biggest concern. Because of the wind? Yeah. Those fears didn't materialize, and there was another positive, the temperature. Montreal just spent several days in a deep freeze. Monday was about 20 degrees Celsius warmer than it's been. 
Given the choice between having snow or frigid temperatures, the choice for some was simple. Oh, definitely the snow. I feel like I needed a break. My face is gonna fall off. For kids with this snow day, there was little suspense. Schools announced Sunday they'd be closed, extending the already extended holiday break. We're not supposed to be home. The kids are supposed to be at school. Everything was supposed to be back to normal. Just not yet. Not yet. After three weeks with a 10 p.m. pandemic curfew, Quebecers can now stay out late. Not that there's much to do. Bars, gyms, theaters, most things are still closed. Ironically, one pandemic measure few complained about Monday was masks. Well, actually, the, the mask kind of helps. Another positive on a day like today is seeing people help each other. In this case, it was a man in a pickup who pulled a couple out of a snowbank. When he was offered cash for his kindness, the answer was a simple, absolutely not. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. Lots of kindness today. And a final note about that storm. A young Ottawa boy is being credited for saving a neighbor. Ottawa paramedics thanked this eight-year-old. They say he located an elderly man who had fallen in deep snow and was almost covered. The boy spotted him and had his parents call 911. Now to the pandemic. Health Canada has approved the use of an antiviral pill. The drug called Paxlovid is the first at-home COVID treatment to get the green light in Canada. It could play a critical role in reducing pressure on hospitals. Abigail Beeman reports on how the treatment works and when Canadians can expect to get access to it. Add another word to your pandemic vocabulary, Paxlovid. This is the first oral COVID-19 therapy that can be taken by patients at home. Health Canada has approved Pfizer's antiviral drug. Particularly important, as access to easy-to-use treatments could help to reduce the severity of COVID-19 in adults who become newly infected uh, and are at high risk. If given early, within the first three to five days of symptoms, Pfizer's data shows the drug can reduce hospitalizations and deaths 85 to 89 percent. But delivering it fast can be a challenge, especially right now with tests tough to get across the country. The public health agency recommends provinces save it for those at highest risk. But there's a long list of medications you can't mix it with, affecting lots of already high-risk people. And there are only 30,000 courses of treatment in the country now now with a million purchased in total for this year. We all know that the supply isn't going to be great at the start. Uh, so for the Omicron wave itself, it may contribute, but it won't be a key uh, contributor to the current wave. Compared to vaccines, they are, of course, a, a substantially more expensive option. Dr. Christopher Labo says initial estimates before any bulk discounts or negotiations were $700 for a five-day treatment compared to an estimated $20 per vaccine, though the government won't say what it's paying for either. When you think of it in terms of preventing people from getting into hospital, they probably are cost-effective because keeping somebody in hospital for five days is very, very expensive. Among the high-priority groups recommended to access the drug, the unvaccinated. It's much better to be vaccinated and not to run the risk of having a severe case of COVID-19 than to have to be treated. And as welcome news as this approval is, it's still early days. We don't even have any peer-reviewed data on this medication either, right? We know uh, a little bit about the drug based on what the company has revealed, but it would be helpful if we had more information. There's a second antiviral drug in the pipeline. Canada has already purchased half a million of Merck's treatment with options to double that. That drug is still under review by Health Canada. Donna? All right, Abigail Beeman in Ottawa, thank you. New vaccination requirements for truckers crossing the Canada-U.S. border went into effect over the weekend. In Manitoba, drivers protesting that new mandate slowed traffic at one crossing. Early this morning, truckers caused delays at the Emerson border crossing in what was called a slow roll protest. The new rules mean that when crossing from the U.S., unvaccinated Canadian truck drivers must show proof of a negative PCR test and then self-isolate for 14 days. In China, authorities have issued a curious request. They are urging people not to order goods from overseas, claiming packages sent by mail could spread the Omicron variant. Beijing confirmed its first case of the Omicron variant on Saturday. Officials say they believe the woman who tested positive may have contracted the virus from a piece of mail received from Canada four days earlier. 
Authorities say they tested the letter and found traces of the virus. The woman's home and workplace have since been locked down and more than 16,000 people have been tested. This is not the first time Chinese officials have linked COVID to packages from abroad. The experts say the virus is airborne and it is extremely unlikely that international mail could transmit it. I would say it's virtually impossible for a great package that was shipped to China from Canada to carry with it infectious virus that would result in a transmission event. And the reason for that is that we know that this virus does not survive long on inanimate surfaces. Beijing's first confirmed case of Omicron comes at a bad time for Olympic organizers. The Games are set to begin in just over two weeks. Organizers are now stepping up measures to try to limit the spread. Today they said tickets to Olympic events will be available to targeted groups only, not to the general public. And strict public health measures will be in place. Spectators from overseas were already banned. We have exclusive new details tonight about a small group of Canadian special forces being deployed to Ukraine. Diplomatic talks aimed at avoiding armed con conflict are at a standstill, and an estimated 100,000 Russian troops are stationed along Ukraine's border. Michael Couture explains what we know about the Canadian deployment. CSOR is an elite group of Canadian special forces operators, and a small group of them is now in Ukraine. They're looking at potential options to support the Ukrainian government and planning for the possible evacuation of Canadian diplomatic personnel. Sources tell Global News the deployment is part of an attempt by NATO to deter Russian aggression. It's a message aimed at Vladimir Putin in response to his amassing of an estimated 100,000 troops on the Russian-Ukraine border. Make him understand that any possible gain that he would have from large-scale military action or even military success in Ukraine would generate a cost that would be outsized, that would be far more than any benefit. Another symbol of support? Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Joly met today with Ukraine's Prime Minister under the guise of trade and economic cooperation. But there's more at play. It is a pleasure for me to come here and uh, to uh, send a strong message on the part of my government, but on the part of Canadians as well. Jolie's presence is part of the ongoing support Canada has provided since 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea. Canada has committed hundreds of millions of dollars to Kyiv in the last eight years and has helped train Ukrainian security forces. I think it does send a message to Russia that, that you know, the, the, who is part of the alliance that is willing to stand up to them and, and you know, show their support and their, through programming, through diplomatic means, etc. Now, Canada is a member of that alliance with NATO, the UK and United States, which sent a bipartisan delegation of senators Monday to reaffirm its support for Ukraine's sovereignty. And some experts believe this is about more than just an ally in Eastern Europe. Uh, what happens in Ukraine will signal to other authoritarian regimes, in particular China, and therefore it's important for the West to, to stand um, collectively. Especially as talks to de-escalate tensions in the region seem to be at a dead end. Michael Couture, Global News, Ottawa. Moment of impact coming up. What's happened to the people of Tonga after that massive undersea volcano? It's now been two days since a massive undersea volcanic eruption near the South Pacific country of Tonga, and the extent of the damage is still unclear. Communication remains cut off because the country's main undersea phone and internet cable was damaged. New video has emerged showing the moment it happened. Atmospheric sensors have detected large amounts of sulfur dioxide gas released by the eruption, which could cause acid rain in Tonga and Fiji. Today, air forces from Australia and New Zealand conducted surveillance flights. Aid groups say they're still trying to determine the impact on Tonga. We're roughly thinking up to 80,000 people could be affected. But how many of them are seriously affected? We don't know yet. The, the first death to be reported is a 50-year-old British woman. Her family says she was on a beach with her husband trying to rescue her dogs when she was swept away. She loved animals. When she started her charity in, in Tonga, you know, it was to help the stray dogs that they have there. 
The impact of the eruption was felt across the South Pacific and as far away as Alaska. Authorities in northern Peru say two people drowned after they were caught in the tsunami triggered by the eruption. There is an update tonight on the water problems plaguing the capital of Nunavut. Officials in Iqaluit are setting up a river water filling station for residents worried about the tap water. Last week, the city said trace amounts of fuel were detected in the water supply after residents reported a smell. Officials say the water is still okay to drink, but they've set up another option while they flush the system as a precaution. People are being told to bring their own jugs. The water is from the river, so it must be boiled for at least one minute. Last fall, Iqaluit spent two months under a water emergency because the water supply was contaminated by fuel. Ahead, how a groundbreaking new vaccine could help ensure no country is left behind. The way out of the pandemic is vaccination, which reduces serious illness and death. But vaccines have to reach everyone, not just people in wealthy countries. In Canada, nearly 78% of the population is now fully vaccinated. Compare that to a country like Nigeria, where only about 2% of people are fully immunized. Progress has been slow because COVID-19 vaccines are expensive, complex to produce, and protected by patents. Now, scientists in Texas are working to overcome all of that. Jackson Prosco reports. As high-tech COVID vaccines have rolled out in wealthy nations, the developing world has largely been left behind, unable to afford them and unable to produce them. We've done an appalling job of actually sharing vaccines and ensuring that the world is vaccinated. It's an urgent problem. Epidemiologists have warned the next virus variant could emerge in a highly unvaccinated population, the way Delta and Omicron did. We are only going to get in front of this uh, pandemic and have vaccines widely available when you have vaccines that are being uh, produced locally, distributed locally, and are made at scale. Researchers in Texas have found a way to do just that, developing a vaccine called Corbivax. It's based on traditional vaccine technology that can easily and cheaply be made almost anywhere. And we think it's a game changer. Many manufacturers can make it. They have all the ecosystems in place. Dr. Maria Elena Botazzi and Dr. Peter Hotez started their vaccine research after the 2003 SARS outbreak. When COVID-19 arrived, they realized what they had. And then, of course, when we saw the sequence, we said, oh, my God, this is like 80 percent similar to the SARS sequence. What's more, they're making the vaccine formula free to anyone who wants it. No patents, no licenses, simply a gift to the world. When you're in a crisis, you really want to do things that are morally imperative and that, you know, that you address the urgency. In clinical trials, the two-dose Corbivax has proven 80% effective against the Delta variant. Studies into Omicron and boosters are ongoing. In India, one manufacturer is already planning to produce 1.2 billion doses per year. Look, if you want to develop vaccines that are for the public good, you need to share your knowledge. In developing their vaccine, the researchers hope they've created a global model for tackling future diseases, one driven by the need to save as many lives everywhere as quickly as possible. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Conquering the Atlantic next from Europe to America, why he's going it alone in a boat. Celebrations are just getting started for this guy, Jonathan, a giant tortoise. He's believed to be turning 190 this year, which makes him the oldest living land animal. And now he's got a Guinness World Record under his shell, too. He's the oldest living colonian. That's a category that includes turtles, terrapins, and tortoises. Jonathan lives on the grounds of the governor's residence on the island of St. Helena, arriving from the Seychelles way back in 1882. Well, slow and steady wins the race, and a British man is attempting to live by that rule. He is attempting to row solo without any help from Europe to North America. Jack Jarvis hasn't hit the halfway mark yet, and he's already dreaming about his next epic fundraiser. Crystal Gamansing spoke with the 28-year-old about his trek across the open ocean. A tiny speck in the Atlantic. Jack Jarvis is rowing unsupported from Europe to North America 
and is trying to do it in 100 days. Four battling winds from the south. Um, every time I stop rowing, I'll be pushed in the wrong direction. With every punishing stroke, he's hoping to raise money for brain tumor research, a tribute to his grandfather. He was a massive part of my life, Crystal. Um, he was one of the, you know, one of the big male influences, first male influences on my life. His brutal endeavor has raised more than $25,000 so far, but he's got a lot of ocean left to cover. We found him in the middle of the Atlantic where he's been rowing 14 hours a day for more than 40 days. And he's been doing it without a critical survival resource. I didn't bring enough coffee bags, so um, I've only got enough for one a day. So it's, I'll, have to, I'll have to reuse it if I want um, multiple coffees a day, so that's pretty tough. That ability to laugh and adapt are proving important for the 28-year-old. Uh, the hardest thing is probably just the missing, missing people back home. His time alone, on the water, thinking about his granddad, can bring up a wave of emotions. He's sharing those insights along the way, documenting his journey on social media. I definitely think people need to go out and get after it, you know, and push themselves, uh, challenge themselves, because the sense of satisfaction afterwards is so much better than you know, anything you get. If that's true, the endorphin rush may produce all-out euphoria when he reaches land in Florida, hopefully in March. 16 miles in the wrong direction. It's what it is. Um, you know, it's not looking great. Testing his strength, spirit, and what he can manage on only one good cup of coffee a day. Crystal Gavance in Global News, London. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is this pair of otters in Qualicum Beach, British Columbia. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.